I have in the studio with me Frank Davis. He's the chairman of the Constitutional and Legal Committee of the Governing New Patriotic Party. I have on my left George Law, who is a lawyer, leading member of the opposition NDC, also a former member of parliament for North Dying in the Volta region. I have our video call renowned lawyer Chachu Chikata, uh, the man who led the legal team of the NDC in the 2012-2013 election petition. So before we went on break, uh, Mr. Davis, you had wanted to listen to uh, actually uh, respond to uh, some of the things said by uh, Mr. Law about the fact that Apenyo Marking went to court even before the speaker could make any pronouncement. And that has been one of the main arguments from critics of, of, of the governing MPP and indeed uh, the now majority in parliament, majority minority, because now this is being contested, that it looks like Apenyo Markin wanted to force the hands of parliament into this by going to the court even ahead of the speaker declaring any seat vacant. Uh, Beatrice, George, maybe he. when a writ is filed in any court of competent jurisdiction and the processes are served on you, irrespective of what position you take on the matter. The general jurisprudence is that you restrain from doing anything which has effect of rendering those processes anagatory. I mean, it's something which is trite. I mean, it's a settled. So as to whether at the time the speaker was going to give his statement, his pronouncement, ruling, or whatever anybody decides to call it, he cannot, sitting here as lawyers, we cannot escape from the factual situation that processes, processes had been served on him. Whether those processes were served legally, regularly, or properly. It's another matter. Yeah, but, but you please, see, please, please, yeah, please, but you please. See, you George, George, you let me, let George, George, when you were speaking, I was quiet. Maybe well. you, when I'm done, you can seek permission yeah. and respond. When you were speaking, let, I was very quiet. Let him land. I'll come to you, Mr. Lowe. As to whether or not the service is regular, it is proper, it is invalid, it's not for you to say. The processes have been served on you. What you do is to go to court and have the service of the processes set aside. That is, if you think that the service is irregular. And not to return like But not to write a letter. I mean, with great respect to the speaker. He's my very good friend, a very distinguished lawyer. I mean, I've known Bagmin ever since I started practice. He's my senior. I've known him. He's a very, very serious person, and he understands what he does. But for me, for me, to decide that because you have not been properly served in your estimation and write a letter to the Supreme Court retaining those processes, I mean, were well, unnecessary. So that was wrong? Yeah, well, was I'm saying it was unnecessary because at the end of the day, whatever he did was, 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 was deemed not to be proper. Okay? So if, if you are trying to say that at the time they invoked the, the jurisdiction, whatever happened was a nullity, George, I mean, you see, don't, don't let us stray into matters which are already before the court, all right? The matter will be determined on the 11th. Do take everything into consideration. This was just an interlocutory application for the processes to be set aside and the order to be vacated. So that is where we are. So don't let us jump into whether it's a nullity. Whether it's a nullity or not, the matter yes, has been you, argued. You, you had the opportunity the matter to has been argued. You George. had the opportunity don't to respond let us now. And I'll come to, to you, Mr. How, Chikata. How, I'll come to you very How could that be a nullity? Oh. Please, if you can just give yes, your brief so, response, and I'll go to Mr. Chikata. You see, bottom line is that my uh, senior and learned colleague knows that service is fundamental to everything. Service is fundamental. Proper service is fundamental. And that is the reason why, Mr. Speaker, because he has had an agreement with Parliament as to the processes they will use, uh, the, the, the courts, the processes they would use to serve him as Speaker and members of Parliament. Mm. Obviously, that process was violated. Mm. So he says, look, this thing that they brought to my legal department, we are returning it because it doesn't follow the proper process. But he goes, mm. you see, again, he goes to challenge that, as he said he must do. So clearly, Mr. Speaker hasn't done anything wrong. 
to return it. He hasn't done anything. He hasn't done anything because he has gone before the same court to tell them that I challenge the service on me of this week. I want I want to get the, the thought of uh, Mr. Chikata. Uh, we're Absolutely. still waiting for Mr. Well, Imed Wenchi to connect uh, with us. No. Mr. Chikata, you heard the, 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 the CJ saying that, and the argument of the speaker was that I have not been served because per the law, I'm supposed to be served on Mondays. And the CJ during her ruling said that, yes, you're supposed to be served on Mondays, but also the law permits us to serve the legal department of parliament any other day. Yes. And that was what she, she, she used to, to, to defend her stance. You've just heard the argument of uh, Frank Davis here, as well as the counter argument from George Law. I wonder where you stand on it. Our submissions. I believe that the issue should not be looked at primarily from the point of view of, of um, the circular that the Chief Justice referred to. And by the way, the Chief Justice took it upon herself to make reference to some earlier circular of um, his, her predecessor in India, which was not before the court. It was not part of uh, what was before the court. I think that it is really um, the Constitution that we ought to look at when we are determining these issues of service on the speaker and the clerk. And it's quite clear in Article 117 that civil or criminal process coming from any court or place out of parliament shall not be served on or executed in relation to the speaker or a member of or a member of the clerk to parliament while he's on his way to attending at or returning from any proceedings of parliament. So the constitution itself makes clear provision. And I believe that part of the reason that the circular was um, issued had to do with some discussions between the chief justice and the speaker as to how this provision in the Constitution should be implemented. But, you know, I am more concerned with what I believe are fundamental problems with the ruling that was delivered by the Supreme Court. And I, I don't think that um, Mr. Davis has persuaded me that we are not, we are not allowed to comment on rulings that have been given because the judgment itself is going to be given um, on the 11th of, of, um, of, of November. Of November. I mean, a, a ruling has been delivered, and there are fundamental problems with it. I started off talking about, you know, the Article 99 reference, which you quoted from, um, you know, in opening. And there's, there are a number of other points. You know, one of the issues that was put before the Supreme Court um, on behalf of the speaker was that even the statement of case which was put before the Supreme Court in respect of the application, the originating process, it was not compliant with Rule 46.2 of the Supreme Court rules. And that rule simply says that there's going to be verification by an affidavit of whatever the plaintiff is bringing before the court. There was no such affidavit. And again, this was not in dispute because the plaintiff, in seeking to oppose uh, Mr. Sorry's argument, did not dispute that there was no affidavit. We didn't hear any response to that failure um, to provide an important element in the statement of case, uh, an important element in the process. Now, the reason why that's important is because it, the rules of the court, the rules of the Supreme Court, have a very clear in Rule 29, where the rules of court. Mm. Your line. Obama fell proceedings unless the compliance is made by the court. Nothing in the ruling indicates that 
nothing, nothing, nothing in the in the ruling indicated the Supreme Court had weighed. And, and you're breaking, you're breaking a bit. I'm sorry, Mr. Chikata, you're breaking a bit. But I just want to. Yes, I'm. I'm sorry, Mr. Chikata, you're breaking a bit. You're breaking a bit. We can't hear you clearly. But I, I want to understand, really, in the nutshell, what you're saying. You, 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 you made a point earlier that you have fundamental problems with uh, this whole ruling uh, and i just wanted to find out from you aside from the procedural one what exactly is is that fundamental issue you have because i i quoted earlier uh, when i was uh, or mr law was on the floor that the chief justice said that procedure cannot override legality so i just want to understand really uh, if that is the point you want to make disagreeing with the cj Okay, uh, so we'll have to uh, reconnect to Chachichikata. The line is not helping us today, uh, but I, I want to come to you, Mr. Yeah, David, uh, very briefly. We still don't have a email entry yet. Hopefully he joins us before we wrap up with the program, but you, you have some response. Yes, I, 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 Mr. Chikata uh, said I, as if I was trying to gag uh, a critique of the ruling. I, I never said so. I never have never said so here. I mean, I, I mean, when the ruling of the court is handed, we all have an unfettered right to critique the ruling. All I was saying is that in the attempt to critique the ruling, don't let us get into the substantive matter. And Mr. Chikata knows that that is the position of the law. I mean, as trained lawyers, that is it. It's, it's a right. I mean, we don't have to haggle over it, right? Now, you see, that's what I'm saying, that I was in the courtroom and I listened attentively. In the affidavit in support of Tadio Soros's application, all right, he had, as most often than not we all do as lawyers, had taken another step in speaking to the substantive matter. Because if you are going to vacate an order or a ruling of the court, your application to be, should be pointed to that, basically. But if you raise issues of the writ not invoking the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. It is another leg of your case altogether. And that's go to the substantive matter. That's what I'm saying. I'm careful. When, 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 when I come to studios, I go to the radio station, I'm careful to limit myself to what has happened. Because when you stray, when you don't take time, you will, you will stray into the substantive matter pending. That matter that Tadiosori raised, if indeed, the Supreme Court, you find favor with the submissions. The case is ended. Because if the jurisdiction was not invoked properly, then there's nothing, to, there's nothing before the court. So, I, you see, I don't, let's, let's stay a thin line between a critique of the ruling and the substantive matter which is pending in the court. Let's, that will be determined on the 11th. So it's not as if I am, I am, I am I'm preventing anyone from critiquing the ruling. I, 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 I don't even have the right to do that. It doesn't lie with me. Let's say a thin line. And Mr. Chikata is back on the line, so we can go to him now for his thoughts. I know you didn't conclude on your thought, but before you do so, though, listening to your argument before the line uh, broke, is it fair to say that the Supreme Court of Ghana is perhaps using, uh, as it were, constitutional interpretation as a cover to assume uh, complete jurisdiction or total authority when it comes to this area? Let me express it in my own words. I am indicating that in that ruling, the Supreme Court failed to apply its own rules of court. And I mentioned Rule 46.2, which requires that when a plaintiff is coming before the Supreme Court with a certain matter in relation to seeking interpretation, seeking enforcement, the, that plaintiff must have a statement of case, and the facts and particulars that the plaintiff is relying on should be verified by an affidavit upon which the plaintiff is relying. There was no affidavit. The plaintiff admitted that in response to Mr. Sorry's application. The Supreme Court's ruling does not tell us why the Supreme Court failed to apply its own rules of court. Especially when there's a Rule 79 which says that non-compliance shall be a bar to further proceedings unless that non-compliance 
has been waived. And there was no indication that there had been a waiver. There are other fundamental issues. You know, in this plaintiff's writ, the article that the plaintiff was seeking an interpretation of was Article 971G. 971G. No, no. The, if you look at the writ, they did not include H. That's a fact. They did not include H. So why was um, the issue of Mr. Honorable Esiama even before the Supreme Court at all? Because H was not a matter that had been brought by the plaintiff. Not only that, the plaintiff did not include the, the uh, NDC uh, member for Amenfi Central in the people in respect of whom he was seeking certain orders of the Supreme Court. Yet the Supreme Court at the end had that member also included in its orders. So the Supreme Court in that sense is acting outside the framework of its own rules, outside the framework of the writ that was put before it. And that, I would like to say, is the reason why a former Chief Justice of the land can make the kind of comments that have been made that, you know, it's predictable. It's almost like when it's, and it's not only her, by the way, I mean, you had a former uh, or like a minister for national security also talk about Supreme Court decisions always tending to go one way. In other words, the issue of the partisanship with which adjudication is going on. So if I get you correctly, what, what you're saying is that the last week's ruling kind of intensifies the perception that the courts are becoming more political than legal. That's what you're saying. Absolutely. Well, I mean, absolutely. But as I say, I like to say it in my own words. And my words are to the effect that observers who are not, you know, members of the opposition to the government and observe. Okay, the line to Mr. Chikata just uh, froze again, but we'll come back to him, wrap up with his thoughts and get the final word of Frank Davis as well as uh, George Law. You're still here on Agenda on TV3 when we come back. We will look at one of the main reasons the Chief Justice used to uh, make the decision she eventually, uh, or take the decision she eventually took, which was that those respective constituencies were going to suffer going into this year's general election because with just a little over a month, there will be no opportunity for a by-election. Don't go away. Stay with us. And you're still here on Agenda. You're welcome back. I was telling you about one of the main reasons the, Supreme, uh, the Chief Justice used in dismissing whatever it is that was before her uh, on just last week before we await the 11th November judgment. And the CJ was concerned... She said that she was concerned that those four constituencies whose MPs were being asked to vacate their positions uh, would suffer consequences of not being represented with just a little over a month to the country's general election. And so this circumstance, Mr. Chikata, you mentioned that uh, the Supreme Court did not use its own uh, rules, but the Chief Justice mentioned that the circumstance we were dealing with as at the time she was reading her ruling was exceptional and mentioned the disenfranchisements, as it were, of these four constituencies. How do you respond to that? Well, the disenfranchisement of anybody does not justify a Supreme Court not complying with its own rules when hearing a case, particularly when it does not give a chance to the defendants to appear for their side to be heard. The Supreme Court gave a ruling, as we call it, ex parte, without hearing the speaker. And the, the, the Supreme Court had every opportunity to hear the speaker. The Supreme Court chose not to hear. And, and you know, there are further problems with the decision of the Supreme Court. The application that was before the court was made ex parte, even though earlier on they had filed a motion on notice for the injunction order. Now, I mean, Mr. Mr. Davis, I'm sure, will recall he in a similar situation in respect of uh, 
Honorable Jachi Koisi, try to get the Supreme Court ex parte to give certain orders without hearing Jachi Koisi. And the first question he was asked as soon as he got up in the court is, are you expecting us to make these orders without hearing, you know, I just happened to be in court that day, you know, we were not uh, served, I was not there as a representative or as counsel for Jachi Koisi. But the Supreme Court itself found it appropriate that an order should be made for Honorable Jashi Koizu to be served before they would continue the hearing in respect of that matter. In this particular matter, the Supreme Court proceeded at breakneck speed with an application that was filed after midday on Friday. The Supreme Court doesn't normally sit on Fridays. Somehow the Chief Justice, you know, who is not all powerful, by the way, let's not you know, when we talk about the, the Supreme Court uh, having power to interpret and enforce and so on, it doesn't make them all powerful or infallible. The Supreme Court decided that on this occasion, without hearing the speaker or giving the opportunity to the speaker to be heard, they would proceed ex parte with certain, with certain orders. So for you, and that was double standard? Well, I mean, there's multiple reasons why that is just not acceptable. But let me make a final point as far as, you know, the, 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 the failures of, of uh, the Supreme Court in this ruling are concerned. You know, the Supreme Court was faced with a so-called application to stay execution of the ruling of the Speaker of Parliament. Now, an application for stay of execution as is fairly elementary within uh, legal procedures, relates to execution of court decisions or court orders. The speaker does not fall within the judicial hierarchy. And so that application itself was completely strange. I mean, let somebody and, you know, let any judge or lawyer point me to where in any of the constitutional provisions, rules of court, court act, and so on, where the Supreme Court or any other court is given power to stay execution of a ruling of the Speaker of Parliament. And on this point, no mm, I, I want to come to Mr. Davis, but I want to come to you with a quote from the, the father of the president in 1968. In that case between a Republic versus Liberty Press Limited mm -hmm. and others, 1968 mm -hmm. exactly, where Mr. Edward Akofuado, then I believe CJ, because eventually he became ceremonial president, said that the judiciary, and I'm quoting, like any other democratic institution, must justify its continued existence. This implies that its actions and conduct must be subject to the same measure of public scrutiny as any other governmental institution. I'm sure you heard Mr. Chico made a point similar to uh, this point. Do you feel that we are deviating from this in 2024? We are not deviating from anything, uh, Beatrice. After the ruling, there has been a lot of critique. And that is exactly what we, we, we are also being called upon to do here. So nothing has deviated from what Akufado CJ Akufado said. Nobody has. There have been a plethora of discussions on all radio stations, television stations, talking about this ruling. And that is what we are doing. Fundamentally, we are expressing ourselves the rights that we have as Ghanaians. I, 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 taking inspiration from what Mr. Jajikata said, I mean, the Chief Justice is not a fount unto herself. She's the head of the judiciary, she's the Chief Justice, yes. But it doesn't mean that when rulings come. But all I say is that there should be moderation in the way we critique and, as it were, lambast the justices of the Supreme Court. It is the language that we use. You know, you, 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 can, you can tell someone up front that you are reckless with your hands. But if you tell the person that he's a thief, the person will be offended. But if you say you are reckless with your hands, before the person goes, to ask it where digest what you have said, you will have. So you're saying we you, should be diplomatic have, with that. Diplomatic with that, along with the way we criticize them. But, but what let would me, you let say me, to those who say that me, you have to say it as it is? Let me. If they assume. Well, well, I mean, we all have ways of speaking. Well, what was the meaning of saying it as it is? If you insult someone, you have insulted the person. And so, let me let me come to the matters that Mr. Chikata raised. 
First, let me let me point out that the CJ, the former Chief Justice so far, who has been misquoted, misquoted every day. What she said was politicians politicizing judicial decisions has become predictable. That is what she said. She never said that the Supreme Court has become predictable. So people should refrain now from, from quoting her. This is exactly what she said. And if you want to lay hands on, on, on what she said on that day, go to the radio station or whichever TV station it is. She said politicians politicizing judicial decisions has become predictable. Now, moving from there, Jachi Kwesin, Mr. Chikata, Jachi Kwesin and this present matter before the court are clearly distinguishable. Now, Jachi Kwesin, we went ex parte. Yes, I wouldn't run away for it. And ex parte applications are allowed. I mean, ex parte applications are allowed. That is why they are funded in the rules. We are all lawyers. Ex parte applications are allowed. If I go ex parte, it's up to the judge to grant me my relief for a limited number of days. It's an interim order. It is not interlocutory. Within the period of that interim order, I'm, I'm called upon to repeat the application on notice. So there is nothing wrong with it. Now, Jachi Kwesin was a sitting member of parliament. Even though the high court at that time had ruled or given judgment to the effect that his election to be a member of parliament was void because of ABC. Now, the matter had been taken up in the Court of Appeal and we're still dealing with the matter. What the Supreme Court asked me was that, uh, Mr. Davis, you don't want to give him the opportunity to be heard. He's a sitting member of parliament. Now, distinguish that from what was happening in this case. Mm. These people have been asked to vacate their seats. That was the exceptional circumstance. They had been made to vacate their seats, so time was of the essence. Time. So I mean, it, it, it doesn't it doesn't change anything as to whether they were given. At the end of the day, they got the opportunity to also put their case across. So it was the exceptional circumstance that the Supreme Court used. And and I want to come to you, Mr. Uh, Judge Low. After that, I'll get the final word from all of you before we wrap up. Well, I I am um, I take a different view, sincerely. In fact, my major problem with the ruling is what is being described as exceptional circumstances. <laughs> what, 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 what is the One month to the general election. Let me tell you what exceptional circumstances mean. Okay. You remember that in the year 2008, in January 2009, the NPP, Per Atatia, went to court to injunct results so that President Mills is not declared uh, uh, president. You remember that? The point is? He went as party. The, even the high court judge said, how can you come with this? Put him on notice. And that is what ended the case. So I'm saying that in this case, why? Judge Kwesin was supposed to have lost his seat uh, and who was supposed to wait for a, 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 a what's it called? A rerun of that election. These are these people who have even less than 20 days to. Why is the exceptional court circumstance? Parliament was going to sit up to about just 15. An order has been made. In any case, the speaker's order, if it must be challenged, should be challenged under 991. Should be challenged under. So, as for anybody who is floating himself around, people can interpret it how they like. I am of the view that, sincerely speaking, they were busybodies. The four people had a right to go, even if their human rights were being. We have a human rights division of the High Court. So, all these things is in that here on there. We are saying that the Supreme Court, per that ruling, have become consistently inconsistent. And it's giving and people what? it's giving people the impression you 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 and who that that they are they are playing politics rather than no George George no that law I'm and you see even that. when your national security I'm minister I'm Mr. Davis please I'll come when to your you national security word. minister yeah. comes to tell you that you have become too consistent in a, part, a certain part, pattern. So, please, watch no, it. I think what Kamda Pass said was that uh, when it is seen, he didn't say that. Yeah, he the didn't make point, an wait, 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 point. wait, wait. The that point I'm making is correctly. that oh. if Kamda Pass had a cause to worry, then there's a cause to worry. He is a national security uh, uh, minister of this country. I, Look, to make it even more the, the rest, you see, when they say when the, the, the frog comes out of water to tell you that the crocodile is crying, you must believe him. Justice that took Immediate past uh, uh, justice of the Supreme Court. And he has been acting CJ you know, on a couple of occasions. 
He is a very highly respected judge of the Supreme Court. When he comes out to say that he believes the Supreme Court shouldn't assume jurisdiction over this. Let me let me get the final word of me. It, clear, it clearly shows that mm. there is something amiss. There's something amiss. That is how we end agenda today. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Beatrice Edu. My panel members have been Frank Davids, uh, who is the chairman of the Constitutional uh, Legal and uh, Constitutional Legal Committee of the Governing New Patriotic Party. And also I've had George Law, who is a lawyer leading member of the opposition in DC, as well as a former member of parliament for North Dying in the Volta region, uh, Chachuchi Kata. Uh, a renowned lawyer and lead uh, l uh, lawyer for the opposition NDC during the 2012-2013 election petition. Uh, well, we couldn't get through to uh, Ahmed Renji, but hopefully next time he can join us. My name is Beatrice Edu. Thank you so much for joining us today. Don't enjoy the rest of our programs. Have a good evening. Join us again next week.